so I can talk to you. <laughs> okay, good evening everyone. Um, thank you for coming out on this strangely warm November evening. <laughs> Although I believe it's going to get a bit cooler later on. Um, oh, there's more people arriving. Um, it's nice to see some new faces as always. It's always nice when we come along and we see some new people coming in. So welcome if you haven't been before. And those of you that have been before, welcome back. Um, just a couple of things. Um, if you haven't been to Cafe Centre Peak before, the whole idea behind it is that you get involved. Okay, so the way things run is we'll have a talk by our invited speaker and then we'll have a bit of a break so that you can recharge your glass and then we'll have a discussion. So, as I say, you need to get involved and we've only got one real rule around here and that's there's no such thing as a silly question. Okay, so no matter what you think and you think, oh, but I couldn't possibly ask that because I don't I think that's quite a silly question. It's not because we've had some really interesting discussions based on what people think might be silly questions. And it's all about getting your ideas across. Because a lot of the time, it's where we get really good research ideas, is by people coming at it from a slightly different angle than the one, <laughs> sorry Liz, than the, than the one that we normally view it from. So any ideas, any questions, please get involved in the discussion. So I think without further ado, um, I will introduce you to this evening's speaker. This is Liz Sheridan and she's a consultant microbiologist from Poole Hospital. And she's going to be telling us all about um, antibiotic resistance. Not so much about zombies, more about bacteria. <laughs> Thanks Liz. Thanks for the Hi everyone and thank you for sort of foregoing your dinner time to uh, come and listen to me. Um, so I thought I'd start with a vote. Um, so, <laughs> hands up, we'll start, we'll start with hands up for urban myth, then hands up for zombie apocalypse, and then we can have don't know as well. So who thinks it's just an urban myth? Okay, this is looking good. Who thinks we're heading for, heading for zombie apocalypse? <laughs> and he's not Which? quite decided yet. <laughs> okay, oh, that's looking good. Um, right, so I'll get straight into some sort of serious scientific stuff before I start getting silly. Um, so what are antibiotics? They're basically things that we use to kill bacteria or at least sort of inhibit the growth of them so that the immune system can sort of fight back. And um, there's a lot of sort of different kind of targets within the bacteria that we can sort of aim our antibiotics at. Um, which would probably not only take me the whole of this evening, but probably the next couple of weeks to explain. So um, do feel free to go and Google it. But at this point, there are, there are many, many options. Um, however, the problem is, ever since antibiotics were sort of discovered um, in sort of the mid 20th century, resistance sort of followed quite quickly. Um, and we haven't really got any alternatives to antibiotics for sort of killing bacteria. So we're, we're kind of stuck with them. And um, yeah, there just aren't enough, enough new ones being developed. So we're, we're sort of quite, quite stuck with this as a problem. Um, so as far as new antibiotics are concerned, there was a sort of, let's see if I can get this pointer thing to work. So, um, ah, so it was working before, oh, there we go. So there, there, was, there was some penicillin appeared, was first discovered like late 20s and was used in the early 40s in the war. And after that, so the next kind of decade or so, is like the sort of golden age of discovery of antibiotics. So there was some finding loads and loads of them. And there was a general idea that sort of infectious diseases were going to be a thing of the past. Then so the 60s and 70s kept on discovering a few, but nothing major. And then pretty much since the end of the 80s, we haven't actually had any new classes of antibiotics at all. So we've been improving the ones that we've got, developing them in ways so that they sort of work better, but we haven't actually had any new ones for quite some time now. Uh, so what I'm now going to do is sort of focus on one particular class of antibiotics, which is um, uh, these things, which are called beta-lactam antibiotics. Um, basically, there's this thing called beta-lactam ring here, which they've all got. So penicillin is one of those, which is the sort of first first sort of major antibiotic that was discovered, and but there's, there's a lot of different classes of these things. So, um, so that's your beta-lactam ring. And um, 
this works by sort of preventing bacteria uh, making their cell walls properly. So why does bacteria need a cell wall? So if you imagine your um, if you imagine your sort of bacterial cell, it's got a nice sort of stretchy cell membrane, and it's all surrounded by um, sort of water, which can quite happily disappear into it. So the thing's going to work now because um, it's working fine. Everyone, yep, that's the way it goes. It's actually. <laughs> Prop number one may actually not work. How much puff have you got? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you flip the thing back, back down? Yeah, that probably needs to go back down again, doesn't it? Yep, keep thinking. Since this one's paying attention. Um, it's still not quite working. I have the same rule every time my bike tires go flat. Okay, there we go. So you've got your water diffusers into the thing. So if I keep on doing this, which I'm not going to because otherwise I won't have a spare energy for my folded bike. Um, if I just keep on going like this, eventually it's just going to pop. And um, what the cell wall does, it's like the sort of tire around the inner tube. It's kind of holding the cell together and keeping the sort of contents under kind of nice sort of tension, but um, sort of stopping it bursting. So if you manage to do something to the bacterial cell wall, you'll manage to burst your bacteria, which sort of pretty much kills them instantly. So, what's a cell wall made of? Um, it's basically made of stuff called peptidoglycan, but it's just little sort of subunits that aren't particularly useful on their own. And what bacteria need to do is make a sort of solid structure. So there's a um, bacterial enzyme, which pretty much all bacteria have, um, and they use that to cross-link with peptidoglycan and um, then they can sort of build up a cell wall like that. So it's, it's pretty much essential to bacterial life. So this is the target of uh, penicillins for a start. So if you imagine that's a beta-lactam ring. So it's a gross oversimplification, but effectively beta-lactam ring binds to this enzyme, which we call penicillin binding protein, um, but I think the bacteria probably calls it cell wall making protein. Um, once you bound your penicillin to it, it doesn't work, then it kills the bacteria. However, um, they're quite clever little things, despite sort of not having much in their gen genome. So they've sort of looked around and they've managed to uh, manage to fight back. So bacteria have got an enzyme, many of them, called beta-lactamase, which um, snips the, uh, the beta-lactam antibiotic and at that point, off it goes makes it cell wall and the antibiotics aren't working anymore. So there's some various things that you can do about that. There's some, you can get something called a beta-lactamase inhibitor, which is a drug that you give with the antibiotic, which binds to your, um, your beta-lactamase and then it's not going to work anymore. So that's, that's one option. So we can sort of give something to inactivate the enzyme. The other possibility is developing a sort of dif different, more powerful sort of form of beta-lactam antibiotic, um, which the enzyme is sort of inactive against. So, not working. <laughs> so that's, um, that's an example of a cephalosporin antibiotic. So that was one of the ones that was discovered probably five or six years after the penicillin sort of came into use. Um, and so I thought, okay, that's fine, you know, we've got past this sort of beta-lactam beta -lactam problem. Uh, but bacteria, as usual, managed to fight back, so they've come up with a better beta-lactamase enzyme, which is a cephalosporin, cephalosporinase for extended spectrum beta-lactamase. So bacteria is still making another enzyme which breaks down the thing that, uh, that's inactivating them. So once again, we're sort of stuck with bacteria that you can't really treat with antibiotics. So a few years later, in the sort of 60s, um, we really thought we'd got it nailed. So we've come up with an even stronger beta-lactam antibiotic um, called carbapenems. And um, at this point, you know, they've got their extended spectrum beta-lactamase. Yeah, no chance. So at this point, it's like, fantastic. Finally, we've found something which is, is going to work and we don't have to worry about antibiotic resistance anymore. But, um, yeah, there was one step ahead. So uh, yeah, there's a thing called the carbapenemase. Um, so, currently we, we, we still have bacteria that can't be treated with this class of antibiotics and, um, yeah, what next, really? So that's, that's, that's just an example of sort of how resistance works to one class of antibiotics. There's, there's, yeah, 
it's, it's, it's long and complicated, but so did, did everyone sort of get that? So if, if there's anything you need clarifying, just yell. Um, so that's, that's a beta lactams, which is pretty, pretty about, I guess, 70% or something of antibiotics that prescribed to those, but yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> And um, these are these, particularly the sort of carb the carbapenemase producing ones are the real sort of super bugs that uh, you sort of hear about and everyone gets very excited about these things um, occasionally and then everyone forgets about it and keeps on taking the antibiotics anyway. Uh, or a virus. Well, exactly, <laughs> yes, we might even start on that one. Um, so that's, so the, these things are out there, but like, what, what's the actual consequences of that in sort of real life? Well. For a start, um, sort of community-type infections are sort of becoming harder to treat potentially. So, as as you've lost the ability to use each class of antibiotic, your sort of antibiotic <laughs> choices become limited. And um, if you've got if you've got people that are say allergic to penicillin, then you're you know if, if you can't give them penicillin, then there's sort of like another antibiotic that you use as first line. But then if it's resistant to that, it's um, becomes harder and harder. And the, the other thing is the sort of first antibiotic that GP prescribes may not work, so then the patient gets sicker, has to come back again. So we um, starting to see things like that. Um, big problem is if you lose sensitivity to the um, oral antibiotics, you may find that the only things that are left you can treat the infections with are things that you have to give intravenously. And so we've had people we've actually had to admit into hospitals for, with fairly sort of simple urinary infections just because there were no antibiotics that we could give them out in the community, so they've actually had to come in each day and have an injection, which is, um, you know, that could be quite a big problem if that was happening on a large scale. And um, it's, it's something that we've seen quite extensively, more in sort of developing countries, so there are things like sort of typhoid that's like getting really hard to treat, um, pneumococcal meningitis, um, there's quite a lot of resistance to that, and then that makes it really quite hard to treat, especially countries where they've got sort of limited resources and they can't afford the more expensive antibiotics. Um, Another sort of major problem is pretty much all the sort of advances in medicine since the 50s have been just very heavily reliant on antibiotics. So any kind of transplants or sort of cancer treatments where you're suppressing someone's immune system, you pretty much have to use antibiotics to uh, sort of keep them alive until the immune system recovers. And if you can't do that, we wouldn't be able to do these sort of life-saving treatments anymore. Also things like intensive care and sort of surgery where you're kind of breaching the, the body's sort of natural immune defences. Um, again, we're very much reliant on antibiotics there. Things like artificial joints, if those become infected, it's a complete disaster. And we really need to sort of, you know, give antibiotics at the time the joints put in to, uh, to prevent an infection becoming established. So, um, you know, if we, if, we, if we weren't able to do that, then something as simple as just putting artificial hips in, which has, you know, been kind of quite straightforward for years and years, uh, would potentially not be possible. So that's, that's a sort of, that's the kind of potential impact of this. But, like, actually... I haven't really sort of said anything about how extensive the resistance is. And um, fortunately, there's quite a lot of data that's sort of collected on it. So there's this um, European Centre for Disease Control that's based in Stockholm, coordinates all data from around Europe. So each country has to sort of submit um, things on rates of resistance of particular microorganisms to particular antibiotics, and they sort of collate it all together. It's a massive job, which you know, it's, a lot of people are sort of working really full time on this. Then they very conveniently sort of stick it up on their website so it's got complete free access so anyone can just look at it and um, sort of see what the rates of resistance are in particular countries. And um, the other nice thing they do is sort of allow you to um, build, get, get sort of maps so you sort of put what, what you would put in and then they'll give you a map of the resistance. So I'm going to just run through an example here which is some E. coli resistant to third generation kephosporins. So the, um, yeah, the third generation kephosporins are um, these ones, and the way they get resistant is by the, uh, the big scissors. <laughs> uh, so they started collecting the data in 2000 for this particular thing. And the, the, the darker green means it's sort of hardly resistant at all, so it's like less than 1%, going up to the really sort of dark reddish brown colour, which is more than 50%, and then it's a sort of gradation in there through that. So if we look at sort of what's happened each year since um, since 2000, so they sort of started off from all that many countries collecting it and then they've more been since. So, so watch, watch it go from green to red. Is this each year? 
So that's yeah. So each so each one of those is a sort of data, data for one year. So um, so yeah, like that's a, that's the last one that there's something available for. So apart from um, apart from Iceland, there's not uh, not any green left on that map, which is um, kind of worrying that in that sort of only kind of 15 year period that an organism that started off being sort of pretty much completely resistant as sensitive has sort of become resistant to these sort of antibiotics and um, you know so in some places up to half of it half of the isolates of that thing are resistant and uh, in that case you're really sort of stuck with just kind of one class of antibiotics left that you can kind of treat it with so um so yeah the organism is e coli and actually if you find out a bit more about it it's, it's not just E. coli in general, there's something quite sort of specific going on. And um, if you actually type the bacteria, the resistant bacteria, you find that a large pr proportion of them are just one particular clone. So if you've heard of MRSA, everyone heard of MRSA? So if, most of the MRSA is, there's just two strains of it, there's EMRSA 15 and EMRSA 16, and like probably about 80-90% of the MRSA in this country is just these two bugs. And actually one of them, like EMRSA 16, sort of started disappearing, so part of the reason it's sort of decreased. So for E. coli, it's this thing called ST131. And um, two things about this. One, it's very good at invading the urinary tract. It's got all sorts of virulence factors that enable it to do that. Um, another thing, it just seems to sort of colonise people very easily. The other thing, it's developed this gene called um, BLA, beta-lactamase, um, CTXM15. So it's the 15th one they discovered of this particular particular type. So this particular bug, this particular resistance gene is just spread all over Europe in the course of 15 years. Um, so yeah, where do the resistance genes come from? So sometimes it's a sort of point mutation in a, a sort of single single gene. Um, but actually others of them aren't mutations at all. So if you sort of go back to Fleming discovering penicillin, there's a sort of story that um, he left the window open in the lab because it was a hot summer's day and the mold spores sort of drifted in landed on the plate and um, just as he was about to chuck it out he sort of noticed this, that there was this sort of clear zone around the um, around the mould colony so that's your mould that's and that's sort of someone's pointed to do a sort of mock-up of it they've got a sort of streak of bacteria there so the clear zone there there's something coming out of the mould which is killing the bacteria so in this case that was sort of penicillin mould and the thing was penicillin um, <coughs> so why would a mould do this you know this is just incidental or uh, but um, if you think about it, out in the environment, there's sort of limited, um, limited sort of food resources that the uh, these sort of microorganisms are competing with. So quite a lot of them will make substances to suppress the growth of other ones, so they've got more access to the food. And then the other ones that are being suppressed will then fight back by making something that allows them to avoid the chemical that the first one's making. And so a lot of our antibiotics are these sort of things that are made by microorganisms to combat other microorganisms. So sort of by definition, out there, somewhere in the environment, whichever antibiotic you get, there's going to be a microorganism somewhere that has ways of evading that, whether it's because it makes uh, an enzyme that breaks it down, or whether it's just got some way of sort of avoiding it um, getting into the cell, or some of them have sort of pumps, so they can just sort of pump it straight out again before it does them any harm. But there's, there's just all these mechanisms that are out there. So the... CTXM15 gene, so that's a nice um, E. coli, because you can swim, it's got these nice little sort of jelly, so you can kind of move around a bit. Um, so CTXM15, carefully sporing antibiotics, so although it's sort of related to penicillin, it sort of comes from a completely different microorganism, so it's made by this um, Cephalosporium mould. So if you're in a sort of, your sort of classical nomenclature, so Cephalos and head, sporium sort of spores, so it's got these sort of heads with the spores on it. So that's, that's where the name of that comes from. And this is an environmental sort of mould. Um, one of the things it causes is sort of rotting in various crops. So that's a sort of maze that's rotted by it. And um, also out in the same sort of environment, there's a thing called Clivera, which is actually a quite close relative of the E. coli. So that's what it looks like to sort of grab on a plate in the lab. And it does occasionally cause sort of infections in patients, but quite rarely. Only people that are quite immunocompromised and um, can't sort of fight off infection very easily. But what it mainly does, it lives in this sort of rhizosphere, which is plant roots have the just very sort of complicated kind of communities of microorganisms sort of growing, you know, some of them help the plant, a lot of them help the plant, a lot of them are just sort of there 
doing various things with nutrients. And at some point, this Clivera has developed the CTXM15 gene, which um, allows it to sort of fight off the, uh, the thing that the Kephlosporin mold makes. So, how does it get from this environmental thing, which very occasionally gets into humans, into the E. coli, which causes lots of human infections? Well, I think I sort of promised there'd be some sort of sex in this, uh, in this talk, and um, this is what it is. It's conjugation. There's ba bacteria um, sort of exchange genetic material through, they sort of get close to each other and put these kind of tubes out and sort of exchange genetic material between them. And it's, sometimes it's between a single species, but it can also be between different species. And um, no one particularly knows why they do it, but presumably it's you know, so that they can develop uh, extra kind of genetic characteristics. So, um, so this is the um, this is the chromosome of the uh, Clivera species, and um, yeah, it's got various genes on it. And um, one of them is the uh, the CTXM gene. And um, so, what it does with that comes out of there, goes onto this thing, which is called a plasmid, which is a sort of mobile piece of DNA that can move from one bacteria to another and carry sort of various useful genes on it. So it gets onto your plasmid, and then there's your E. coli. That's the E. coli chromosome. So it just takes that into the cell, and now it's got this gene, so it can make the enzyme. And um, if it's feeling really enthusiastic, it can actually take it off the plasmid and um, integrate it into its own chromosome. And now it's pretty much permanently resistant to kephlosporins, and it's going to be quite difficult to get rid of that. Plasmids kind of come and go, but you know, once it's integrated in the chromosome, it's, it's pretty much there for life. Uh, <coughs> so, yeah, so the main thing about this is there is this way that genes can go from one organism to another. You can go from a sort of harmless species, this is like this chimera, to a pathogen. And also, within a species, um, it can go from one strain to another, so they don't need to wait for sort of mutations to build up, which can take quite a long time. Um, so you've got some insulin <coughs> resistance. Um, so, so far, so I, hopefully I've sort of given you a vague idea of what the significance of, back, of my, um, antibiotic resistance is. Sort of an idea of how it might work, how the genes spread, um, you know, how extensive this, this is sort of on a kind of global scale. So, um, question is, why, why are we seeing this resistance increasing? So, um, any thoughts on this? Why, why, why are we suddenly getting more antibiotic <coughs> resistance? Yep. You also go to the doctors and ask for a, the antibiotics for a cold, which is probably a virus in any case, but we, some of us don't want to go away without that prescription yep. antibiotics. So, so they don't finish them, etc. Yeah, so but, you know, too much use of antibiotics in the community, probably people's expectations are that they sort of want more of it and not taking them properly. Um, yep. The use of antibiotics in farming. Um, <coughs> that's a possibility as well, yep. Good one. It, yep. It's because uh, we increased the consumption of antibiotics, so the, bat, the, 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 the bacteria got more resistant to those ones and therefore... Yeah, so yeah, just some using more antibiotics in general. Exactly. So, yeah, so, so it's basically, basically using antibiotics is going to sort of drive resistance, so... Um, how does it actually work? It's the sort of evolution in action, really. Which is quite exciting. I used to work with an antibiotic pharmacist who was a uh, Southern Baptist, and they're creationists, and they don't believe in evolution. But she sort of believed in evolution here, so we were always trying to figure out how she could sort of not believe in evolution, but sort of still believe in it at the same time. And I never managed to figure that one out. But um, she was a very good pharmacist. Um, so, yeah, I've got it so do you, do you imagine you've got your population of bacteria? There might be a couple that are resistant or have a sort of decreased sensitivity for whatever reason. Clobber them with antibiotics, gets rid of most of those ones, and then that allows the resistance ones to sort of predominate. And um, that's how you've sort of selected for it. So particularly if you're giving antibiotics at a sort of lowish level, so it only sort of locks out part of them, um, and it gives, it gives the ones that are sort of slightly resistant a chance to sort of increase, and then you can have a sort of gradual process. But um, any exposure to antibiotics is, is going to do this. So, um, how much antibiotics are we actually using? So, again, this ECDC collects, they also collect data on antibiotic use. So, um, that's sort of mostly countries, I think they haven't necessarily submitted any. So, 
So we've got um, Greece in the lead, where they uh, seem to be using quite a lot more than the next one, which is France. For, for the French, for whatever reason, they love taking... Um, is there anyone French here? <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, there might be someone on the internet that watches it. From, uh, there's, I think there's a sort of culture in France of sort of people liking to be given kind of stuff from the, the doctor. And the doctor. It's just, it's just cultural differences across Europe, that's just what it is. Um, Greece, probably the same. Uh, Netherlands, they're just very controlled with their sort of antibiotics, so the Greeks are actually sort of taking about kind of three times as much. But that's not because there's more infections in Greece, it's just people in the Netherlands are uh, sort of. Well, I don't know, they just don't have the expectation of being given so many antibiotics, I guess. And then yeah, there's a UK sort of somewhere in the middle, and it's, it's not that much variation really, but um, yeah. So we know sort of how much antibiotics is used, so does this actually correlate with rates of resistance? Um, so I wrote this idea that sat at the back, <laughs> you can't read it, but I can't even read it anymore actually. So. Um, so if you divide the antibiotic use into antibiotics in the community versus the hospital, um, so community use is big variation across Europe. So again, you can see sort of Greece are using quite a lot, Cyprus not so much, um, probably Romania quite a lot. Um, again, Scandinavian countries aren't using that much. Um, Holland again not using that much. Uh, but then you, you sort of imagine whatever was going on in the community would probably be similar in the hospital. It's not. So Finland don't use very much in the community. You use a massive amount in the hospital. And um, as do we in the UK, France, um, not quite sure what that actually means. This is just a sort of you know, mass kind of usage, so I haven't really sort of got any precise data on what exactly is happening there. But so we've got a vague idea of how much is used overall. So if we look at, I've got sort of two examples of organisms. So this one here is a sort of typical community organism. So again, it's the E. coli, it's one of the sort of main causes of lots of types of infection and um, I decided to look at resistance to fluoroquinolone so it's an antibiotic called ciprofloxacin is the sort of commonest one which is used quite a lot in general practice because it's very effective and it's absorbed well in a sort of tablet form um, so if you, look, if you look at that there's quite high resistance everywhere including these sort of countries that don't even use much antibiotics and there's a reasonable correlation, so Greece uses a lot of antibiotics in the immunity or a lot of resistance, but Spain and Portugal don't use very much, but they've got a huge amount of resistance to that, so this is sort of 25 to 50 percent of this sort of red colour. So it's, it's, doesn't, it's, it's obviously not just the amount of antibiotics they use that are driving the resistance, so there's, there's obviously slightly more to it than um, meets the eye. And then when you look at this Klebsiella and carbapenem resistance, so Klebsiella is a but that's quite similar to the E. coli, but it's, it's more something that you see in a hospital context. It doesn't tend to cause infections in people who haven't already got some sort of medical problem. And, um, and that's the, uh, that's this one. <laughs> so it's only good worry about it. And um, so if you look at that, Greece has got, it doesn't come out that well, but actually there's a sort of light red, which is these ones, and then that's dark red, which is sort of more than 50% which means that more than 50% of infection caused by this organism in Greece, they're going to really struggle to treat because the there's like one or two other drugs you can use, but they're very toxic and not very effective. So big, big problem. And then the rest of Europe, you know, UK and Finland use loads of antibiotics, virtually no resistance to this, um, in this bug to this, um, this antibiotic. So it's obviously, it's obviously not as straightforward as just, you know, you use a lot of antibiotics, you get a lot of resistance. So, um, a lot of it is, I think, down to how the antibiotics are used. So I've got, I've, I've got this picture, there's an article in um, Nature about the fact that India is uh, finally deciding to sort of try and stop the, uh, stop the sale of over-the-counter antibiotics, because um, currently in most developing countries you can just buy whatever antibiotics you want. Um, you know, in Ethiopia trying to set up a study on antibiotic resistance. And um, yeah, I just went into this sort of chemist on the the sort of main road in um, Addis Ababa. So there's this little market stores. You, you can't buy anything useful at all. Um, like, you know, I still wanted to get one of these big plastic bags because I'd sort of bought a whole load of stuff I wanted to take back. You know, the, the big sort of um, PVC ones? Like, so I couldn't even get one of those. But you can go into the chemist and you can buy these, like, really sort of powerful antibiotics that in the UK you would only be able to get on prescription. And um, India is particularly bad because you know it's a relatively wealthy country, so people can actually afford to buy the antibiotics. 
And um, yes, yeah, so this is a pharmacist in uh, Chennai in sort of South India. And I've got a colleague that works there, and like but their rates of resistance are way, way worse than the Greek ones. It's like everything's resistant to everything. Um, so there's, you know, so there's, there's that aspect of, sort of antibiotic use of just being used in a sort of uncontrolled way without any sort of microbiologist doing any tests first, without necessarily even the doctor sort of prescribing it. And um, yeah, so that, that just means you're really breeding resistance. The other thing is, as well as sort of encouraging the resistance, is actually controlling the resistant strains and stopping them spreading from person to person. So, so in hospital context, you know, we're always kind of banging on trying to encourage people to sort of wash their hands more. But um, there are actually quite straightforward ways that you can sort of control the spread in a sort of hospital environment and it's sort all of fairly successful. But when you get out in this sort of environment at large, so there's another picture from um, from India, so you've got your open sewer there. So imagine people are taking antibiotics, they're gonna get all sorts of resistant things there, whereas people fresh drinking water coming from who knows. So but it, it's it's all gonna be sort of circulating circulating around in the in the system. So if you just sort of test people at random that have um, sort of been exposed to these things, you find they're carrying <coughs> the resistant bacteria in their gut, which aren't actually making them ill, but they've got them there and if they get given antibiotics you're instantly gonna sort of find it's there. So there's, there's these sort of issues of um, you know, whether, whether we're sort of doing things that control the spread, how we're using the antibiotics, how much we're using the antibiotics, um, but still not explaining everything. So there's something else happening. So actually it's the chicken in the room rather than the, uh, rather than the elephant. So um, yes, antibiotic use in farming is um, a sort of major contributor to it that, um, you know, so however careful we are about sort of not getting antibiotics from the GP. So US, 80% of their antibiotic use is in farm animals. So, you know, so if everyone sort of just stopped getting any antibiotics at all, you'd still have these things being exposed to sort of vast numbers. So that's sort of 9,000 tons of it. There's 100,000 tons of antibiotics in China and you just tread to animals, which is actually a lower percentage, I think it's about sort of 50%, isn't it? Um, I think it's on meat production, so the, the sort of calculated on average per sort of kilo of meat in the sort of animal at the time it goes to slaughter, how much antibiotics it's taken. So you, you've probably heard this thing about how much water is, um, is needed to produce a kilo of meat, but there's also this idea about how many antibiotics affect it to produce a kilo of meat. So, so again, fairly average UK and Denmark, so that's 50 milligrams per kilogram. That's, that actually seems quite a lot to me, because when I'm, when I'm giving antibiotics to patients, like, you wouldn't give anything like 50 milligrams per kilogram. That's like a huge amount, so they must be given like, a lot kind of through their entire life. Um, so, yeah, Sweden very well behaved, like, only 14 milligrams per kilogram, that's still not that great. US, that's four times what we're using in, the, um, in, the, in Europe. In Cyprus, 400, like what are they doing? Kind of makes you not want to eat your halloumi. Um, I don't know what's happening in Cyprus because I, after I saw this, I was sort of trying to find on Google why there was, but yeah, there's, there's nothing there. That's <laughs> obviously happening, but um, so what are these actual, what's the actual benefit of these to the farmers? So sort of three main things. One is growth promotion, makes animals grow quicker if you feed them antibiotics. Um, another thing is preventing diseases, and then obviously if they get an infection, you can to treat it. Which is fair enough. But the basic bottom line is it's cheaper giving antibiotics than, than not. Um, and so you can increase your profit margin. So, yeah, you can't really see that, but it's just a general sort of idea. Um, so you, you get sort of marginal gains in the sort of speed that is poultry, but also all animals, like sort of mammals as well. If you feed them antibiotics a lot, it's probably because it's sort of... Um, reduces the gut flora, which means more of the nutrients kind of just go into the animal growing rather than just being used up by the things in the gut. And um, so this is this is a paper from I think the sort of 70s or so. It's about avapartin. Avapartin is an antibiotic that's related to vancomycin, and vancomycin is one of the sort of main antibiotics that we use to treat things like MRSA in hospitals. So it's you really don't want to get resistance to that. You get resistance to that, you get resistance to vancomycin as well. And, um, but if, yeah, I mean, if you look at the sort of figures, so like, if you don't give them any antibiotic growth management, um, and sort of, you know, by the time they get to, to 49 days old, which is presumably the age that they're sort of slaughtered at in the 70s, but it's probably even younger now, 
Um, so you know, it's 1.8 kilos and it's 1.9 kilos. So it's not it's not massive. I mean, does this really justify it? I don't know. I'm not a chicken farmer, but um, and then if you look at the the sort of cost of it, this is from a report that was done in 1980. So they, they in the US, so they come up with some sort of various ideas. So if you just ban the tetracyclines and penicillin that people have heard of, so you probably want to do that, you you know, it would cost a bit more. Then you ban some more. If you ban all of them, it was, they thought it was going to be $19 per person per year, extra cost on meat, which was sort of four billion, which I think was quite a lot in those days. So presumably nowadays it would be even more. So it's, um, although it, yeah, it doesn't sort of seem to be that much, if you sort of look at it in those terms, you can sort of see why they would um, resist quite vigorously sort of being told what to do antibiotics. Um, considering our profit markets are actually quite narrow anyway, it's probably the supermarkets that are sort of making most of the, most of the profit. Um, so, but we, we've actually known it's been a problem for years. I mean, it's the, I think it must be in the sort of antibiotics were sort of used in humans in the sort of 40s, and by the 50s, they were already sort of said, you know, people had figured out you could feed them to animals and it sort of had very useful effects. So, so, the 60s, there was this outbreak of resistant salmonella, and the House of Lords Commission was a swan report. Um, so they've, you know, so they're already sort of saying quite categorically then hazards to human animal health leads to resistance in enteric bacteria of animal origin and resistance transmissible to other bacteria. So they already knew that then, and they're transmissible from animals to man. So, frankly, you know, 1969, that's nearly 50 years ago. Um, uh, so there's, there's been sort of slowly we've had a regulatory sort of framework kind of develop that's. Um, try to control this a bit. It's particularly for this use for growth promotion. So they must still being used for other things, but they so Sweden in the mid-80s banned the use of antibiotics for growth promotion. And they're obviously always a bit ahead of the game because they were the country that had the sort of lowest, lowest usage in livestock in general. The EU took a bit longer, so the first of all they banned over pass in, in the late 90s, and a couple of years later some more classes of antibiotics. Uh, yes, yeah, so they're still having Sort of conversations about it, but they haven't actually done anything yet. The rest of the world, absolutely nothing happened at all. So, you know, Brazilian chicken, I wouldn't touch it. Um, not just Brazilian chicken, uh, Thai chicken as well. I would say. So, if I'm, if I'm buying chicken, I sort of make sure it comes from a country that I know has some sort of regulation. It's kind of safe for you, but do you really want to contribute to this one? Um, so, that's growth promotion. But um, actually, there's some other things they use for in agriculture that are non therapeutic. So, yeah, like I said before, if the animal gets sick, you obviously want to treat them. Unless they've got foot and mouth disease, so instead of making them better, they shoot them and stick them in a quick, quick line and set fire to them. But uh, if it's a bacterial infection, they'll, they mostly seem reasonable to treat. Um, so, what this is is an aerial picture of a feedlot in the States. So, that's the kind of road going through. And then these are all pens with cows in them. And it's basically, there's no sort of grass or any kind of natural vegetation, they're just fed and cooled and they're sort of fattened up very quickly. In these sort of, it's quite an unnatural sort of environment. Um, and so they tend to have to use a lot of antibiotics to stop them getting sick. So, tetracyclines in cattle rations. So, this is just antibiotics in their food. Um, so, control of liver abscesses. So, like, Access in your liver, and it's pretty nice. Our patients get those sometimes, and they're really sick. You know, they sort of come in and they're really not looking good. Um, so, the reason the cows are prone to the liver abscesses is because they're not designed to eat grain. Same way they're not designed to eat bits of other cows, maybe, I don't know. And um, so, basically, it's like a ridiculously rich diet, and they develop abscesses in their liver. But if you feed them antibiotics, that will sort of prevent that happening. Um, and there's this thing, shipping fever, which um, is a sort of range of infections. But it's basically, if you sort of uh, remove the calf from its mother at a very early age, stick it in a crate and sort of ship it off half around the uh, around the country, it gets very stressed and they sort of, yeah, they can be prone to sort of more infections. Um, yeah, you can prevent that with antibiotics. Foot rot, well, yeah. <laughs> um, there's other ways of preventing foot rot, like maybe just letting them stand in the grass. But, um, yeah. There's been quite a lot of debate though as to whether the sort of usage in agriculture is actually the source of resistance in humans and so there's all these economic arguments and the fact that people have been using them for the last sort of 50 or 60 years that sort of um, tend to fight back quite a lot. 
So I mean, the sort of one, one main argument is, well, actually, the species that cause infections in humans are, are different from the ones that uh, you find in animals. So you know, like also, you, you test your meat, you find it's got resistant bacteria, but they're not the ones that cause infections in humans, so it's not a problem. And um, even within sort of species, so something like E. coli is just carried in the gut of every vertebrate on the planet, sort of different strains of it. And this ST131 <coughs> strain that I was saying about earlier is it's a purely human strain. It's occasionally found in sort of pet dogs and things that catch it off their owners, but apart from that, it's, it's, it's a huge, same as MRSA, so you can give that to your pets as well. Um, the other thing is organic meat, you test that, that's got resistant things in it as well. So, you know, these animals haven't been fed antibiotics. But, um, so those are the sort of counter arguments, but then we know about these transmissible genetic elements, so, you know, theoretically it's definitely possible to transmit it from the sort of animal bacteria to human ones, and actually there's quite a lot of direct evidence that's building up, and there's quite a lot of papers already published on it. And um, what's particularly nice is this study that I heard about when I was at a conference earlier on this year. Um, so this guy Lance Price is, um, is doing it in Flagstaff, Arizona, which is a really sort of cute little kind of retirement town that people sort of go to. There's kind of one hospital, there's a one sort of GP practice kind of clinic, there's two supermarkets. People buy all their food from the two supermarkets because there's nowhere else they can get it from. And um, people don't kind of move around very much. It's quite middle of nowhere, so there's, there's not much movement in and out. So it's quite a nice sort of enclosed population. So what he did for a couple of years was twice a week they went into the supermarket, took samples of all the meat that was for sale, and also they collect samples from E. coli, from infections, from all the patients that were either going to the GP or the hospital, and they just sequenced the genomes of everything uh, to see if they're the same ones or not. And they've, they've sort of got some preliminary, yeah, preliminary stuff out already. So. Um, so if you look at sort of antibiotic resistance, so meat isolates and human ones, so clinical is the dark ones, so that's the human ones, and then the meat is the light ones. So ampicillin with clubs yellow this one was, which is the thing that's like the UK only and it's more than a hospital one, so they're all resistant to that anyway. Um, but then a lot of these, no resistance in the human isolates at all, but then the animal ones have got loads of resistance, so it's a gentamicin, which is a antibiotics that's reserved for severe infection. We don't really see any of the human ones, but the meat's like full of gentamicin resistance. And then this one here is multi-drug resistance. Um, so that's things where the bacteria resistance is sort of several classes of antibiotics, so not just the beta-lactams, but it might be beta-lactams plus gentamicin plus cyclopoxacin. And um, so you're seeing a lot of that, several times more in the meat things than you are in the human ones. Um, and, uh, Right, okay, I'm feeling a bit tired at this point, but uh, I'll sort of explain what this is. Um, so this is, like, what, when you, if you sequence genomes of things, you can then sort of see how related they are and construct this, which is called a phylogenetic tree. Uh, so basically, each one of these circles is a sort of strain of a bacteria. So if it's a small circle, it means that they didn't get very many of that one. So some of these only found one. A few of them are sort of lots and lots of them. And then the distance apart is how related they are. So some of these ones here, like one thing out on the limb, not related to anything very much, probably not that important. It's a big cluster here, so they're obviously related to each other, another sort of small <coughs> cluster here. So he sort of colour coded it. So red is the ones that they got from meat, and yellow is the ones they got from these human urinary tract infections. So you find there's some strains that are in the humans, but not in the meat at all. And some strains are in the meat, and a little bit in the humans, but mostly just meat. And, um, but there's a lot of crossover, so something like that, there's, it's mostly human, but it's, it's in the meat as well. And um, this one was particularly interesting because they found that it appeared first of all in the meat, then they waited a few weeks later and then it started appearing in the humans. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not conclusive, but I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's pretty much a sort of smoking gun, isn't it? It's like, you found it in the meat first, it's got into the human, it must have come from eating, eating meat. And um, you could say, well, maybe they sort of got infected the other way around and they're sort of, the, you know, the chickens always, particularly turkey, I think this one came from, um, they caught it off of humans. Uh, well, not really, because all the turkey farms are in California and this is in Arizona and there's just no, none of that kind of agriculture going on there. So um, I'll be really excited when this is actually sort of fully published. But I think it's going to